But what we are going to, to do right now is to focus on <coughs> one of these parts. So this way to divide a network has been specified by uh, a group, and it's what we call the open system uh, interconnection and architecture. And this uh, architecture is developed, is defined in seven layers. So, and what is very strange here is that we are going to create worlds. So we are going to use things you never heard about before. I will never say packet. I will never say messages. Because when I say packet, you may understand something. You may have already some uh, notion put to a packet. And if you don't have the same notion uh, assigned to packet, then when I say, you send a packet, some people may do something, and other people will do other things. So we are going to create here a very strange vocabulary to describe things. And this vocabulary will be used everywhere. At, at all the levels, we see what is a, a level or a layer, we are going to use the same words. So in fact, it's just because what I call a black box in the OSI model, it will be interaction between, it will be viewed as a layer. So black box is a layer, and when I interact with the layer, I send a request. This request will do, will generate some activities in the black box. I don't know what is this activity because it's a black box. But I know that after a certain period of time, I will get here indication. Indication says that from the black box, something arrives and say, okay, you have received a message or someone wants to talk with you. So from this indication, you will talk to the black box and you will have a response. Response, okay, I, I do that with, I accept the communication, or I recognize that I have received the information. And the black box, and the one that sends the request got a confirmation. <coughs> So this is what is standardized. And you see that it's very generic. So we can apply it everywhere to uh, plenty of things. For example, you want to enter into a Joel office. So you knock on the door. So you send a request to enter into to the room. Joel, so Joel here, but someone is knocking on the door. So say, OK, you can enter. And so she sends you a response allow you to enter, and then you open the door, so you have the confirmation. So you see, you can apply this to everything. You, you can also represent this with time, which is better, you can understand it better. So I send a request. I have the information. I send a resp I can have a response, and this response may be a confirmation. So here I have all the possible exchange between me, I understand who I am, and the black box. So we can you can have a vision here, or you can have a vision here. But you see that it's two different persons. 
So how we can call <coughs> these persons in the OSI language? We can say a program. But if I say a program, it means that there is some C code behind it. But maybe it's hardware. And I may have one part of the protocol that is implemented in, with a protocol, and the other end is using hardware. So say program is very difficult. So what people use in the OSI model is to say that is an entity. So in our example, Joel is an entity. We will not tell her. But she is an entity here, and so you, uh, the entity here is implementing a protocol. So in the OSI representation, you have interaction with your local entity. And here you have communication with your local entity. And these entities communicate virtually by exchanging protocol messages or messages defined by the protocol. So how are we are going to call that? So as I say, we messages is you are you have already you know you have assigned some concept to messages. So I'm going to invent a world and if I invent a world I know that nobody will have a concept on this world because it's totally new. So there is a a way to, to create world or acronyms in uh, OSI it's to make a description of it. For example, if I have a fork, you know, every, everybody knows what is a fork, and everybody, when I say a fork, you see a fork in your mind, but nobody has the same representation of fork. So I have to, if I want to describe it, I will say that, for example, a fork is a tool to grab food. So I give you a description of a fork to pick food if you want. So here I have a tool to grab food. And what I'm doing, I just take the first letter of my sentence that describes my fork. And so a fork in the OSI model, so will not be a, that kind of things, but will be a TTGF. Okay, and I will now call TTGF. And this way I have the generic name to call everything that is used to grab food. Of course, here it's a stupid example. But if we look at what we are doing on networking, it's here. We are using a protocol here to exchange information. And what we are going to do here is to exchange inf information formatted by the protocol between these two entities. And in the OSI model, we call that PDU. And what is a PDU? It's a protocol data unit. So I write, I write a sentence to describe what I am exchanging, and I take the first letter to say that it's a PDU. So here you see it's very, very generic. This way you can apply this everywhere. You can use the same name, the same convention anywhere because I don't I have so generic names here that I have no problem to adapt it everywhere. So what I've done the OSI model is to say that, for example, if I continue my definition here, I, you know that I am using the service of my black box 
to send the information remotely. But here, same thing. Here, it's a virtual communication. So this entity cannot talk directly with this entity. So it means that this entity will have to use another entity to talk with this one. And for example, when we saw the web page, here I, am some, I have something that standardized HTTP, and I say how oh, I can represent the information. I want this page, and the way the page will be uh, sent to me. And to do that, I am obliged to use the service of the TCP layer. That will change the nature of my communication link and will use its own protocol <coughs> to send data. And here, of course, this information will arrive to be sent it. But here the link is again virtual. So here I have to define another protocol. <coughs> So here, for example, I will have my IP protocol. And my IP protocol will be between two entities. But this way, these entities are connected by a link. And so here I can send it to this host. This host will analyze the information and will send it on the, here we are on the same computer we'll send it to another entity that talk also IP, and we'll send it on the link to <coughs> another entity, etc., etc., until if the network is well defined, works well, until the packet arrives to the destination, and then it will be sent to that entity. So you see we are going to stack protocol Different kind of protocol, it's what we will call a layer. <coughs> so, OSI defines, defines seven layers. So, why seven? Because it's a magic number, you have uh, <laughs> Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you have uh, Seven Wonders of the World, etc. You have the Seven Day of the Week. So you have also the Seven Layer of uh, the OSI model. So don't focus on Seven. It means nothing. Or it's appropriate to some system. But it's what we call a reference model. It means that I put some concept to a layer. If I tell you that it's a layer 2, then automatically you will add some concept to layer 2. For example, limited scope, so I can join something that is close to me, but I cannot reach everybody on Earth. I have very simple addressing scheme. So it's the things you, you can add to, to layer 2. If I say it's a layer 3 protocol, then you will imagine that it's a worldwide protocol, which have no limitation in terms of distance, number of users. So it's something that we call a scalable protocol. So it means that you can add more and more users. In a bioposition, layer 2 is generally non-scalable means that it works well when you have few users. And if you add more and more users to your system, the fair performance will go down. So that's the kind of things you have to assign to each layer. <coughs> if I say it's a layer one protocol, then you know that it's for transmission of binary sequence over a link. So that's what you have to understand. That when I give you a layer, I give you some properties. But in reality, you will never find implemented on your computer the seven layers. 
For example, internet doesn't implement the seven layers. You have some layers that are not useful in the internet network. For example, layer five has no meaning. We can discuss that later, but no meaning on the internet network. So you will not have this. But in fact, you have kind of the opposite. It means that you may have an IP layer, and you have, for example, in the internet, something called a tunnel. And a tunnel is you have your IP packet, and you put it again into an IP packet. So, which level? IP. So I say IP is layer 3. We'll see that in the future. So, this IP in IP, is this IP a layer 3 or layer 4? So, uh, there is no meaning. It depends how you use IP. For example, if I am an engineer that creates a tunnel, I will say that this IP is a layer 3 protocol, because I can join everybody. And here I am using a special layer 2 protocol, which is IP, because this IP can just send the information to another point. So it means that that's the good definition here, limited scope on very simple addressing scheme, because I just send it to another end on my network. So here I will consider that IP is a layer 2 protocol from this point of view. Now I am the engineer that works on that network. So here we say I'm working on layer 3 protocol. And this thing comes from the upper layer. So it can be viewed as level 4, 5, 6, 7. So it depends on your point of view. So it's very difficult to assign a number to a protocol because it depends on where you use it. So that's why sometimes you will have less than seven layers. And sometimes you may find that you do a lot of encapsulation. And it means that you will find a lot of either, for example, if you are using ADSL, when you are using ADSL, you have your modem at home, so what we call in France a, a box. So here you have, I will not go into details, but here you have a protocol that is a layer two protocol, which is called ATM, and ATM, allow you to reach an equipment here that will, what we call a DSLAM. On the DSLAM, so over ATM you have a PPP protocol, and then you have IP. So PPP is a point-to-point -point protocol. We will see what it means. And then, so you have your box here, and you have your IP. So here it's quite logic. These two are layer two. So ATM is layer two. You put another layer on it, but it's keep layer two, and here you have layer three. But here, after the DSLAM, it can be but much more complex. For example, here my DSLAM is connected to an IP network. And this IP network, for example, is managed by France Telecom. But here I am not a subscriber from France Telecom. I am a subscriber from another company that offers me an internet connection through ADSL. So what we I do here is to create a tunnel and send the IP packet to a router here that belongs to the company I pay for the ADSL connection. And here, what do I? I will use here a protocol called L2TP, Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol, to send the information. So what does it mean? It means that my IP packet here will be still carry on PPP, like what we have, I have here. So this part will be copied here. But here, instead of ATM, I will have 
L2TP protocol. An L2TP protocol is over UDP and over IP. <coughs> and this IP, this IP is here, and this IP is from this provider. So now, which level is IP? Here you see that IP is layer 3, so it's 4, 5, 6, 7. <laughs> so if you put here TCP, because you are using a TCP, and HTTP, if you follow that logic, we have 9 layers. So that's totally stupid. Okay? So don't think when we look at the reference model to implementation. What is important in the name is reference model. So it means that it gives you some concept assigned to a protocol. So usually we'll say that IP is a layer 3 protocol, and nobody will say that IP is a layer 7 <laughs> protocol. That's really stupid. So here we continue to have a layer 3 protocol because we have some properties. And depending on your point of view, you can consider that this is a layer 2 protocol, or this is an upper layer protocol. So in the internet world, we say upper layer protocol to say that it's what's come from over, but we don't know what, we don't care about what is we have inside. We just carry the information. So that's something very tricky because when you look at the OSI model generally, you think about implementation. And here you don't have to to think about uh, implementation. So, here is uh, this uh, beautiful model. So I will go briefly to see what is the need for all these layers. And then, during the rest of the class, we will go in more details to see some way to implement these different uh, protocols or layers. So of course, when you, you can say it's a layer one, or it's a physical protocol. So you can use either the name or the number. Usually, we, we use the number, so nobody understands what we say. So we look more clever by saying that it, instead of it's a network protocol. We say it's a layer three protocol. So that's, you look more. Nobody understands you, and that's the goal of this thing. Because in fact, networking is very, very simple. So if we don't invent strange name, then uh, everybody will say that it's stupid what you are doing. But <laughs> since the name are very, very strange, everybody thinks we we do very complex. Uh, so, what is a physical layer? In fact, physical layer is mean that I have I, I represent a network here. So my network is a graph, and I have point-to-point -point link between the nodes I have represented here. And now I can have a diversity of way to join the nodes. For example, I can have um, wire, cable, so copper here, but point, you can join one node to another, but I can also use optical fiber, or I can use radio links. And of course, I will not uh, code my binary information the same way if I am using uh, copper or optical fiber. Because here I am sending electron, and here I am sending photon. So coding can be different. So that's what we have to, to agree, because of course, if I'm sending, for example, a frequency of, uh, let's say, um, 20 kilohertz to say it's a 1, and 40 kilohertz to say it's a 0, if the other end doesn't understand the same way my kilohertz, then I will not have a 0 and 1. So I need a standard that tells me how to code this information. 
And of course, it can be very, very complex standard. So if you, when you will go to breast, you will see a lot, for the master of science, you will see different ways to code information. You will see turbo code, etc., etc. So here we will not go into that detail because what is important for us is that after this, before this link layer, I have some modulation. But after the physical layer, sorry, so I have this modulation that is received by the other end. Here, I have a binary sequence on the other end will receive or understand we create the same binary sequence. So that's the goal, and when it's binary, it's computer science, and we don't care about physics. So here I will, we will see some uh, good property we expect from a computer point of view of coding, but during this class, we will not go in too much details about, uh, about coding. So here it means that now, with my physical layer, I am changing the nature of my communication channel because before my protocol, I am sending modulation. And after applying my protocol, I am sending a binary sequence. And since I'm sending a binary sequence, I'm very happy because it's the computer language. And so we can make communication. Of course, the communication is quite limited right now because I just, I'm just able to talk to the other end of my wire. So, the problem is that people in breast doesn't do their job correctly and sometimes we have errors. I'm joking so that they don't do their job correctly because they make a lot of progress in the way you code information and we have less and less error on the channel. That's it. Allow us to simplify a lot of things. But sometimes an error can occur. And so if an error occurs, then you have to correct it. And that's why we have a second layer, <coughs> which is called data link. And data link will be able to detect, at least to detect errors, and in the best uh, situation to correct errors. But normally, as I say, links are quite good. And we are going to do all we can to reduce the number of errors on the link. So usually, you don't correct, you don't correct errors directly by coding. But when you receive something and this thing is wrong, and you have some way to see that this thing is wrong, then you send a request to get it again if it's wrong. So we create a protocol, what we call IRQ protocol, active request protocol, that when you detect something wrong, you ask for a transmission. And by doing that, I am changing the nature of my link. Because before my data link, I have a, a link that was that allow me to send binary sequence, but, but from time to time I had an error. And here I can correct this error. And so after that, I have a variable link between two entities. But these entities are directly connected by a physical link. In fact, I can talk to everybody around me and I can send them correctly the information. But it's just something that is very close to me. So, what you have to see here is that I say that we can use IRQ, but we, you can use also forward error corrections. It means that some coding that corrects the error. And you can also have some hybrid codes 
So for example, in, a G, in GSM or 3G networks, what you do is that you send the information, so you have the information, and you send some extra information that we call, we'll see why, uh, correcting error code, cyclic redundancy code, that allow you to detect errors. And if you detect an error, you don't ask for retransmission of the information. Instead, you ask for the forward error correction. So here, the sender will send you the fake, and by using the fake, you are able to correct what was wrong on what you, on what you received. So this is called hybrid. Because you request not for the same information, but on the way to correct it. So this is used in uh, 3G networks to, to correct it. So you can imagine a lot of way to do it. So we are going to see some uh, very traditional way to do that. But in some network, it's a little bit different. So here. What do I have? I have, and ah, yes, the other thing that is important is that at the physical layer, what do I send is a flow of signal. I cannot stop a physical layer. If I'm listening to something on a wire, I can add zero volt, no, no signal, but no signal is an information. So the information never stops. So it means that um, what we saw before is that I say that we are in computer network, we are sending what I call a PDU. You remember what it means? Protocol, Protocol data unit. unit. Good. So PDU has a start and a end. So it means that here on my physical layer, I have no beginning, no end. And when I'm talking about PDU, I have a start and an end. So I have to wait to cut my physical signal into something that, has, that is limited in size. <coughs> so that's something I want to do at Data Link. We're going to see how we do that. We can correct or detect errors, as I say. But in fact, at this uh, point, we don't need Addressing, or addresses. Because I am on a wire. So when I'm sending information, I know that the information will arrive at the other end of the wire. So I don't have to designate to who I'm talking. It's natural because the physical link tells me to who I'm talking. So addressing is not very important at this level. But when I'm going up, I'm going to network layer. It's no more the case, because here at uh, network layer, what I want to do is to jump from link to link to reach the destination. So what do I, what I have done here? For example, here, if we come, I come back to the previous slide, I have I had here an optical link, and on that link I am using IRQ. So I made a reliable link between one and two. So I am able to send information that will be understood correctly by two. So two, two will <coughs> analyze the information, and by the information that I put in my layer three PDU, I will be on the layer uh, network, uh, not two, will be understood, able to understand where I have to send the information. So we'll send it to four. I don't know why he's sending to four, but two <coughs> has more information than me and knows that he has to send it to four. So here, what we'll do, I will continue to have an optical link, but here I will use a fake. Doesn't matter, here is just a convention between these two nodes to send the information. Then, 
I have to send it to 5. And here I know that 5 is a radio link, and I am using an hybrid code to send the information to 5. Don't care. It's just a way to send correctly the information from one point to another. And etc. etc. you will reach your destination. So it means that here your layer 3 PDU will be copied from link to link using different coding, different way to recover from errors, but we don't know, we don't care, it's just what we important for us is the property, not the way you implement the property, it's a black box vision. And this way, we can jump from network to net, uh, host to host to join the destination. So, what is important here is to have an address. Because when I'm sending on that link, I can reach any other computer on Earth. So I have to designate these computers. So I have to create an addressing scheme that allows me to designate these, uh, these computers. So how we can do that? We can, uh, for example, uh, say uh, this is computer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, as I did. But here it means that you have a global vision and you can give uh, an address to, to everybody. And of course, when I'm here and I want to join 8, it doesn't help me a lot to know that it's 8 or 9, because there is no logic on the address. So what you, we do generally is that we are, we are going to use, a, at this level, a hierarchical address. Like when you give your address, right now, you give your name, your street number, your street, your city, and your country. So that's the postal address. And in the postal address, so when I don't know I'm a postman, I receive a letter, so I read it that way. I want to send this information to India. Okay, I don't have to look at this. I just look at the country, it goes to India. So I put it in a, in a box, and this box goes to India. When the box arrives to India, we look at the city, and you don't have to know all the people in India. You just know the city, you send the information to that city. So the postman in that city knows the name of the street names. So when he arrives on the street, he can look at the number. He puts it on the mailbox, and then the person that opens the mailbox looks at the name and is able to know to who is this, uh, who, is, uh, who will receive the letter. So it means that when you have something hierarchical, you don't have to know all the information concerning your network. You just have to know some part of the network. So for example, if you look at an IP address, 193.42.74, uh, one, so it's something from Telecom Bretagne. We have the same thing, it's hidden into the address, but this means Europe. This means Telecom Bretagne. And this is a computer into Telecom Bretagne. So it means that a router or node here in the US doesn't have to know all the computers at Telecom Bretagne, but ju just know that everything that starts by 193 is located in Europe, and will send this information to Europe. And so this way you can reduce the amount of information you need to locate the nodes into your network. So it means that at layer 3, you will have address, and these address are generally hierarchical. So here we cut into packets, and of course, we can have some problems. We can have transmission errors. In the OSI model, it's not a problem, because we have a data link that corrects the error. In the internet, it's 
more a problem because our data link does nothing, does not correct errors. Because we know that errors are very, very rare, so we don't care about losing from time to time a frame. So it's not very nice, it's not in conformance with the OSI model, but we don't care. We see that the OSI model is not freely respected by the internet. But we have something worse. We have something worse, that is, when, for example, I have a link, let's say uh, 10 megabit links here, and I'm receiving traffic coming from different equipment, piece of equipment, and these links are also 10 megabytes thick. So what will happen? Uh, so what happens is that here, for example, I can receive 20 megabits of, uh, bits of information and I can only leave, exit, 10 megabits. That means that here I can have a memory and I can store the extra traffic expecting that uh, one of them will stop and I can fetch. But my memory is limited. So it means that after a period of time, I may lose some packets. Okay? <clears throat> so what can we do? It depends on the technology. In some technology, I can tell the, the previous guy, stop sending me information because my memory is getting full. So it's what we call flow control, as you say. We send a message asking the other to stop. But the internet, we don't have this. And that was a big problem because we cannot tell the previous guy, <coughs> I have too much information. Of course, the previous guy can tell the previous guy, etc., until we reach the source. But we don't have this in, uh, in the internet. So what happened in the early day of the internet is that here I, uh, I was losing some packets because the memory of the router was full. So what happened? If I am losing a packet, I have a TCP protocol that is used to, co co to correct errors. So for example, if I have lost a packet, then I will resend it. So I have a congestion here, and all my nodes that my source that will uh, with has lost packet will send again the packet. So they increase the, the charge on the network. Because they send more packet than uh, before, because they try to correct errors. So they can amplify the congestion here. And so you are going to lose more packets. And since you are going to lose more packets, you are going to send more packets, and so the condition will continue. So that was a big problem in the early days of the internet. And we have a guy that we call Von Jacobson that defined a very strange protocol on TCP, a very strange flow control protocol, but say that when I have lost a packet, I receive, I get some information that tells me that I have lost a packet, generally, generally it's not due to a transmission error, because the network is foldable. So when I'm losing a packet, it's more because I have some congestion uh, equipment, so, uh, some congestion nodes in the middle. So if I'm losing a packet, then I reduce my transmission speed. And by doing that, I allow the congestion node to uh, send its packet and suppress the congestion. And after that, I will send again at the full speed. So we develop an algorithm that do this kind of work. So that's very strange. And in uh, doing your class in Rennes, 
<coughs> you will have a, cla a total full class uh, for TCP because TCP is a very, very complex protocol. And if the internet works nowadays, it's because we have this strange algorithm inside TCP. So flow control, usually we don't care about that. We talk a lot, and we will talk a lot about error correction. But flow control is also something very, very important in networking. Because you don't have the same speed on all your links. For example, here at Telecom Bretagne, your links are between 100 megabit per second and 1 gigabit per second. And when you leave Telecom Bretagne, our link is 20 megabit per second. So we don't have the same speed. So of course, if all the students are sending information at the same time, so we can, in our network it's okay, but when we leave the network, then we have a congestion. Statically, it's rare. But it can happen in some strange areas. For example, uh, before the exam, when you want to go to the blog and, and see uh, the exercise, then you may create a condition. So this is uh, one, uh, one possibility to, to do things. So that's when we do a transport layer. We have to do congestion control. We have to recover losses if needed. And that's something that is uh, done in the internet, which is not really always the case in uh, all of the network. But here, loss recovery is not done by the network. It's done by the end. So if the computer that are both ends of the network. So if you are doing voice over IP, you don't care about losses. Because recovering a loss means that you send a message, can you send me again the packet I have lost? So it will take time. So it's good when you are sending an Excel file because you want to receive all the bytes of your Excel file. But when you are doing voice over IP, it's better to hear a noise, let's say I have lost a packet, than to wait a delay to recover this packet. So the net, in the internet protocol, the network can adapt to what you want by, for example, disallowing, uh, suppressing loss recovery. If you are using uh, Skype, Skype is a good example of bad implementation, but good product, but bad implementation concerning the network. Because if you are losing packets due to congestion, what will do Skype? It will send more packets. So, for example, you have your voice packet, you send it twice. So, maybe you will lose one, but the other will continue to run. So, this is one possibility. Of course, it's not good for the network because you may increase the congestion, but for the user, it's a good thing. So, that's something also that the mathematician like a lot is a trade off between what is good for the user and what is good for the network. And generally, it's not the same. So you have to, to find the optimal compromise between both needs. And that creates a lot of paper, a lot of studies about fairness uh, on the net. So here, we have four layers that are well understood and almost implemented in every system with some uh, Violation sometimes when we look at TCP models or internet models or TCP IP, we see that the, the boundary between transport and network is not so clear. But in the uh, first approach, you have these four layers. But when you look at the upper layers, it's not so clear. So you have the session layer. So session layer was, I've not talked about that right now, but we see that on, uh, when we will study in more detail the layer three. But <coughs> you have two kinds of layer three. One is called connection oriented, and the other one is called datagram. 
for two different kinds of protocol. For example, IP is a datagram protocol. And for example, when you do a phone call, you, have, you are connection oriented. So, what does it mean, connection oriented? It means that you tell the network, I want to, tell, to talk with this guy. So you remember the principle we have uh, developed at the beginning of the class. So here you have a black box. No, we don't know how it is implemented. And so you, what you are doing when you do a phone call, you dial a number, you talk with the black box, which is a telephony network, and after a certain period of time, the telephony uh, network tells, OK, you can talk with guy, or we are now uh, telling the, to the guy that you, are, you want to talk with him. So it means that this communication, in fact, will set up some configuration into all the intermediary nodes. When the test setup is complete, you can send a message that say, we want to talk with you. This guy wants to talk with you. And so when it's OK, you can exchange data on the link you have created on the net. So it's called connection oriented. Because you have three phases. One is to open the connection. Open the connection means that you set up some configuration in all the equipment. Then you can exchange data. And then you close the connection. So closing the connection means that you are removing context on all the equipment, piece of equipment where you create a context. So that's connection oriented. And the other way is datagram. And datagram is something where I say, I'm sending a packet or information, and I give the full address. And each node will analyze the full address to know where you send the information. It's like, a, for example, you are in France, and you want to, to send to your family in your country uh, your life, you, uh, how you live in France. And you write a lot of uh, very, very long letter. So you put what you write in several uh, postcards, and you send all these postcards. So the postman, every postman will process individually each letter. You don't create a connection. You don't create some state in the postman mind to say, OK, there is a lot of letter concerning. So this mod is. Uh, it's easier to implement here. Yeah? You don't have to manage a context. So you, you can write it. it do, you don't have to write as many code is needed to, to do that. But here you don't have quality, because each packet is processed individually. So for example, if you exchange two letters, then you will not receive all the letters in the same order. Or if you lose a letter, the postman cannot detect it. So it's the receiver that can detect that. So the network is very, very stupid. So that's the internet. We have a stupid network, but it goes very fast because it doesn't have a lot of things to do. On the opposite, connection-oriented, allow you some quality of service. So that was very important uh, in the early day of the telephony system because we don't have a lot of bandwidth. And so we, we have to optimize the resources. And by having a view of the <coughs> network, of all the flow, it was easier to organize the network. So now imagine that you are with your mobile phone on a train to Paris. You approach to Massy Palaiso. And here you have a lot of tunnels. So you are doing a phone call, so a connection-oriented uh, communication. And you enter into the tunnel. So what happens?
You lose connection. Then you leave the tunnel. What do you do? Nothing, because there is no tunnel after that. Uh, yes, you try again. And do you start again the conversation with the guy at the same place? Or at the beginning? I was saying, you try to synchronize with the guy, and so you first open a connection, you start talking, you use the connection, you leave the tunnel, so you start, you open again a connection, and you say, oh, I was talking about what? Ah, yes, I'm talking about that. And you continue your conversation from the point you close the communication. So that's the goal of the session in the OSI model. That's the goal of the session layer, is to put some synchronization point. And if you close your connection at a certain period of time, then you start again from the session, uh, the synchronization point, not from the beginning of file. So you are sending a big file, the communication is cut, you don't send it again from the beginning when you reopen the connection, but from your synchronization point. Now you are on the same train with your mobile phone, but now you are surfing on the web on your phone. So you start downloading a page. You lose the connection because you enter into the tunnel. So what do you do after? Then you continue to download the page. So here is because I am in datagram, so I have no connection. In fact, my network has a failure, but the network will correct itself. And then I can continue to work. But so here I open my connection, but it's just as we saw TCP is just a conversion between both ends. And inside network doesn't know about connection. And if I have a problem somewhere, the network will heal itself. So from TCP point of view, it's just a long silence, but it will work after. So it means that here I don't need a synchronization point. Because this failure is not seen by the network. But when I establish a path, you see that when I'm creating a context for telephony, I see what is the next stop. And when I have some problem here, this one cannot, so it's not directly this one, but the previous node doesn't have to send it to the next stop. But we have to find another path. So what we do, we suppress this context everywhere and we create another one. So we have to open a new connection. So that's why synchronization session layer was developed because at the beginning we have a lot of connection oriented protocol. But with IP we don't have any more connection oriented protocol at layer 3. We have datagram protocol so we don't really need uh, a session protocol. Then we have presentation layer. So until now, what was very important is to send binary information from one point to another. But the question is, will computer understand the same way the binary uh, information? For example, if I'm sending an integer number, will it be understood the same way by two computers? So well, that's a, a big problem. And so we have to define some, uh, some universal representation of the information. So as usual in networking, you have a lot of universal representation of the information. So you have to agree on what universal representation you will use. So one of the well-known is XML. So XML use ASCII, 8 bit, uh, 7 bit ASCII, so it's known by every computer. And then you will create tags where you put your information. This is understood by every computer. So these letters are understood the same way. 
And for example, I have a tag, let's say your name. And a tag that say you not, or you mark at the exam. So when I'm sending information to Joel, giving the result of your exam, here it's probably X, as key. So my Macintosh will use a kind of representation, his own representation of the mark to the universal representation. And Joel pieces will take this universal representation and will create its own representation of the mark. So this way you can send information without ambiguity from one point to another. And finally, you have the application protocol. So we have already seen a very simple uh, protocol, which is HTTP. And you have your get and you get the information. But you have a lot of every application can create his own application protocol. So normally, when we will talk about network, we will talk about layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, layer 4, and layer 7. And layer 6 and 5 are forgotten because they are mixed in layer 7 in the internet model. But the OSI model uses this. Uh, so I propose you to to have a break.